Lots of gold is still out there waiting to be found. But when you go to a river or a stream, where do you actually sit down or you know, dig in? Where do you actually go to find the best spots? And how do you know what the best spot is? The truth is that gold is not evenly distributed through a stream. Even on a really rich gold bearing stream, you'll find that the gold is here or, in, or maybe there, but most places it'll be little or barren, even in a good stream. Like I say, gold placers are almost always spotty, and even in a good stream, there's going to be lots of bad places to dig, and only a handful of good places. To find those spots, you need to be able to read the river and see what it would look like when it's depositing gold, and see where the gold deposits, the rich spots in that river, are going to be. And that's what you're looking for when you're reading a river. You know, what you know about gold matters a lot. Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and today we're talking about the skills you need how to read a river for its gold. Now, no matter what kind of equipment you use, whether it's a sluice box or a dredge, a gold pan or a metal detector, dry washer, whatever kind of equipment you use, the equipment can only recover gold if there's gold there to be recovered. You have to find the gold as the prospector. You have to know where to look. The equipment only helps you actually recover it. So the more you know about where gold hides, the better your odds are of doing well when you're out there. That's why some guys do so much better than others. You know, you can have one guy or two guys digging in and working hard all day for a, a few specks, and another guy, maybe only 25 or 30 yards away, spends the same day and gets several grams or, or more. If you want to learn, well, the first step is to learn a bit about placer gold geology. And that's kind of the stuff we're going to be talking about today. Now, most gold originally comes from some kind of hard rock deposit, whether it's a quartz vein or some other kind of shear zone or some other kind of deposit. It's some kind of hard rock deposit is where almost all gold comes from. We get placer deposits because gold, metallic gold, is very resistant to weathering or corrosion. Because gold is so durable and resistant to corrosion and it doesn't undergo weathering, the gold just accumulates it. It basically, the, the veins and the rocks wear away. They oxidize a lot of the felspar minerals and the micas turn to clay. They're washed away by the rains and the gold isn't changed. It remains as particles of gold and it gets washed into small drainages and eventually into bigger drainages and eventually into rivers. But because the gold isn't destroyed, it accumulates in certain spots along rivers as placer deposits. These are the rich spots that you as an individual prospector want to be finding. That's what we're all looking for. That's why it's so important to understand a little bit about this and know that it's from these hard rock sources that the gold originally comes. Let's take a couple of quick looks at some hard rock gold. Here's a piece of rich hard rock gold ore, but the quartz is totally fractured and, and broken up. And you see the gold here, a piece like this tumbled around in a stream for a little bit. It's going to all break up and the little bits of gold will be released and you'll have bits of free placer gold. Here's a very different looking piece of gold ore, but again, it's friable and fractured and turning around in a river or stream, tumbling around, it'll be broken up and the gold will be released as free particles and be able to start working its way down to bedrock. Now, even a mountain that has hard rock gold mines in it, it's just too dilute to produce a worthwhile deposit on its own. That's because you may have a giant mountain and then a little vein here and another little vein of gold and quartz over there. But the volume of the mountain is huge and the, the volume of the gold even in the quartz veins is small, let alone compared to the whole mountain. So you're talking about a giant amount of rock a giant amount of stuff that's not gold, and then a little bitty little bit of gold. But because the gold doesn't weather away, it accumulates. 
And rivers and streams act a lot like a sluice box does, at least in the sense, of course, a sluice box is nice and regular, it's made, and, and the, uh, a river or a stream is a natural thing, it's complex and has twists and bends that a regular sluice box would never have. But because gold is so dense and so heavy, it acts like a sluice box in the sense that the sand and the gravel and the clay that are formed from the decomposition and weathering of the rocks is washed downstream and the gold resists movement and tends to stay behind. And so because the gold resists movement, because it's so dense, it tends to accumulate in spots. And these are the good spots in the stream that we're looking for when we read a river. And that's just what we mean when we say to read a river for its gold. It's to see those spots where heavy minerals like gold, because gold is very heavy, are going to accumulate in a stream where there's going to be a natural enrichment as the gold stays behind and the lighter stuff gets washed away. Now, this is a concept that you need to understand. It's kind of the beginning. So let's take a look at an illustration and talk about it a little further. This kind of shows the idea I want to express. You can see the mine dump, the brown mine tailings dump in the front. That's an entrance to a mine. And then kind of above it on the hill, there's another entrance with a gray dump. And But this is a, a gold-bearing vein that's in this hill of rock. And you'd have to wash away, in order to make a placer out of this, you'd have to wash away a whole mountain of rock and leave behind the gold that's in the vein in this mountain. And that's kind of what has to happen to create a placer deposit. You wash away mountains of rock and leave behind or collect or accumulate the gold that was in the veins in the rock. Now, like I say, placer deposits are natural accumulations and they come in a variety of different types. Actually, river placers are only one. Um, they come in a thing called residual deposits. Take a quick look at that. Here's a little gold bearing quartz vein in the ground in Nevada. And I found a little bit of gold here. And if you know, you find gold right next to a vein like this. That's what your residual placer is. It's stuff that's just broken off the vein and hasn't really traveled any distance to speak of. Hillside deposits. We'll take a quick look at that. Now, here's a diagram that kind of explains residual and hillside or alluvial with an E placers. The stuff that you find right next to the quartz outcrop, of course, is residual. But as the material works its way down the side of the hill, it's a hillside or alluvial with an E and that kind of placer. And then once it makes its way down into a stream, then it's a, an alluvial with an A placer. And that's, of course, what we're going to spend most of this video talking about. Beach deposits. We'll take a quick look at that. This is a shot of early day beach mining in Nome, Alaska. And what happens is when you get the right wave conditions, often due to storms, you'll get a winnowing effect that the uh, ocean waves will pull out the light sand and leave dark uh, iron, you know, black sand type surface on the surface of the beach with any gold that's in it. And so you winnow away the lighter material and leave behind the black sand and gold. And oftentimes these layers of black sand don't last for very long. One or two tides and, you know, it's gone. And it has to wait again until the next storm or other wave action comes along to reform it. Desert, uh, what they call Eolian or windblown placers. We'll take a quick look at that. This is a Neolian or windblown desert type of surface that I took a picture of when I was in Western Australia. The surface is fairly flat. The white colored rocks are quartz. The dark colored rocks are ironstone. And then the brown material that's in between is what's left of the bedrock. It's deeply weathered, turned mostly to clay and a little bit of sand. And it's been taken away mostly by wind and a little bit by washing. And it basically leaves behind materials on the surface that don't weather. And this includes gold. So in this type of placer deposit, the gold is fairly close to the surface. And then alluvial. These are water form uh, placers that are washed by streams and the water and the flow of water has a huge effect on how they form. These are what we're talking about today when we're talking about reading a river. 
And so let's look at an illustration of alluvial. This is the kind of river stream that we think about when we think about alluvial placer gold. You know, the rounded river rocks. Uh, this is, of course, is the summertime flow when it's pretty. And this is the time when we're out there digging in the banks looking for gold. But because of that flow of water, the gold and heavy materials quickly work their way down to the bedrock where they get caught in crevices or other obstructions. And this kind of illustrates that, that way down on the bottom is the black sand and the gold. And then what goes with alluvial river deposits, of course, are bench deposits. These are deposits that are formed as the river cuts down in its bed, uh, pieces of gravel are left high and dry standard, stranded above the current river level, which may be down here, but it used to be up here and there's still some gravel left. It's an important idea to have when you're reading a river because it can help you find gold. Let's take a look at an illustration. Here's a diagram showing uh, bench deposits. You know, A in the middle at the bottom there is the water and C is the gravel that uh, even though some of it may be out of the water in the summertime when the floods get going and there's really high water, all of C is underwater. But the, the material that covers the slopes up above that's marked B, that's the bench gravel. And really bench gravels are a great opportunity for the individual prospector. And I've found many ounces of gold looking in these kinds of places. And so we'll talk a lot more about them later on in the video. And then ancient river deposits. There are some times where uh, the material cuts down so fast and, and goes through so that you literally have a, ancient river de deposits that are stranded or uh, away from the modern streams. This can happen too when you have a river channel that gets filled with lava. Um, the hard lava that's fresh is, is so hard that it doesn't want to weather. And so what will happen is the water draining will seek to go elsewhere and you'll have these ancient river deposits. We'll talk more about them, but let's like, take a look at a picture or two. Now you might look at this picture and see the rounded smooth rock and the rounded boulders and gravel and think, oh, well, this is a modern stream. But no, this is a river that hasn't flowed in a good 15 million years. The modern stream where the water is flowing is more than a thousand feet below where I'm standing. This is way up on up near the top of a mountain. And so this is an ancient tertiary river gravel area that was worked and most of the gravel removed by the old time miners in Northern California. These kinds of deposits were rich with gold and I've found lots of gold in these types of deposits. So if you have them in your backyard, they're a good place to look for gold. Okay, let's talk in more detail about alluvial placers, river placers, that sort of thing. That's what we're talking about today. Now, sorting by water is the key to the whole process of forming these concentrations. And it happens because gold is so very dense. It resists movement. So when you have gravel and you have a flow of water, the gravel and sand and pebbles and stuff and even bigger rocks, cobbles and boulders can be pushed along in forces that won't move bigger pieces of gold. Now, the size of the gold and the size of the rock make a big difference. You know, a, a, a flow of water that would move a boulder will certainly move uh, medium, small nuggets. But that's the way it works. So cobbles, you know, the force of gold that will move a cobble, say something like this, will move a small flake of gold. And when you get down to small rocks and hand size, fist size things, you know, that will flow of water will only move like, you know, tiny flakes and little fines. It just, it takes a lot more flow of water to move gold. And so what happens is the flow of water washes the the lighter materials away and the gold tends to, as the lighter materials are washed away, it tends to work its way down until it hits the bedrock. Okay, let's talk about sorting by floodwaters. Now, I, I mentioned that it takes a lot of force to move a piece of gold, a lot more than it takes to move a similar size piece of rock. It's because rock or gold is so dense and rock is comparatively lighter. It takes more force. And so when we're talking about pickers and nuggets and 
any bits of gold of any size, we're talking about situations where it takes fast flowing floodwaters, whoosh, uh, to move that stuff around. It just doesn't uh, move around even with a, a high spring runoff kind of a flow. Now as prospectors, we're out generally looking for gold um, in the summertime or nice weather, that kind of thing, when the stream may be flowing, you know, slowly, the water's a little warmer, it's certainly a not, lot nicer to be out there, uh, but the gold is not being moved around when you just see the water trickling along in the stream. The gold is moving when it's blowing stuff out, causing damage and knocking trees over and blowing trees down and blowing boulders down the river. That's the kind of, kind of big flood is the kind of situation when gold is actually out there moving. Let's take a minute to just imagine what that kind of flood looks like. Now, we're used to, like I say, the trickle of nice stream water, but when it's moving gold, it's rolling along. It's not like a trickle, trickle, trickle. It's moving along like a freight train. And the kind of noise that, that's happening is like a freight train going by. It's all the boulders bouncing off bedrock, you know, trees and stuff flying down the river because they've been ripped out of their banks because the water's come up. You know, we're uh, one of the streams that I'm going to show you in a second, I'm used to dredging there back in the day when dredging was legal in California. And, you know, it was kind of hard to find places where you could get your waist wet. You know, most of the time when you're walking through that, you maybe had your knees wet or a little above your knees. And, you know, the water was pretty shallow. But when it's a flood, that same stream is like 15 feet deep. It's like twice and more, you know, way taller than I am, way above my head. And if you fell in, your chances of survival would be pretty near zero. So considering those terrible floods, let's take a look, because I do have a picture of a big flood that happened about 25 years ago, uh, but it'll illustrate what the kind of situation is when the water is really moving gold, including decent nuggets. Let's take a look at those pictures and I'll explain further. So I'll show you first what the river looks like in summer when most folks are out prospecting. It looks beautiful, very inviting. You could get in the water and enjoy yourself. It's a little cool if you don't have a wetsuit, but it's just a lovely little river. And this is what that same river looked like when gold was being moved. The water, instead of being three, four foot deep, two, three, four foot, it's 15, 20 feet deep. It's rolling boulders that are the size of a van or bigger. It's just churning and rolling along like a freight train. And like I say, if you fell in this, you know, sorry, you're, you're probably going to die. It's just, it did major damage, this flood, all over northern Nevada and northern California. Roads were washed out, people were isolated, uh, a lot of property damage, but it formed some amazing gold deposits. Here's another view of the same flood at a different point along the road. It formed some amazing gold deposits. There was a huge pay streak laid down right in the middle of a popular campground. And the guys that were dredging back then, because it was still legal, the guys that were dredging then were getting half ounce to an ounce a day. And a bunch of them, not just one or two guys, because it was a campground, there was all kinds of guys there and they were all getting great gold. I know guys that went out and there was exposures of bedrocks with nuggets all over it. The quarter ounce nugget that I found a few years later was probably laid down in this flood. But this is what it looks like when gold and nuggets are being moved. Now gold, even in these big floods, it tends to move in a certain path. There is what they call a line of travel or a run of gold where the gold tends to go in a stream. And when gold lays down this way, it's called a pay streak. Um, there are other terms for it, but the one that's most common that I'm used to is pay streak. It's a, a basically a line in the stream where there's a line of enrichment and you find a lot more gold along that line of enrichment than you would either side or other places. It's, it's that line of enrichment that has the best gold. Now, because the, uh, the force of water, I've said, to move different sizes of gold, um, because the, 
amount of water it takes to move different sizes of gold is different. The line of travel is a little bit wide. It's not, it can, in fact, it can be eight or 10 feet wide, depending on the factors in the river. Um, and, and what happens is, is on the outermost side, like on an inside bend, the part that's closest to the faster water is gonna be your bigger gold. And as you move in, the gold will get smaller and smaller. So you go down to smaller nuggets and then pickers, and then finally finds mostly, but not very many pickers. And that's your width of the pay streak in the stream. And that's why when you do have an inside bend and you're working across the inside bend, not along it, but across it, as you get into the pay streak, you'll have finer gold. And as you go further out into the water, closer and closer to the outside part of the bend, you're gonna pick up coarser and coarser gold nuggets as you go across the pay streak. Now, long lines of straight river where you have you know, pretty much even flow, all going pretty much in the same, you know, pretty straight line, same direction. Um, that, that line of travel, the pay streak, will tend to widen out and disperse. And in long straight stretches, you really won't have much of a noticeable pay streak. Let me show you some pictures to kind of explain how this works. This diagram shows the distribution of coarse and fine gold in pay streaks. And basically what it's meant to show is at the edge of the gravel where the rocks are coarsest, because that's where the water is fastest and only bigger rocks will slow down there. That's where the gold is going to be. But as you move inward away from the fast water up into the bank on a bend, then you start getting finer and smaller gold. It's just how the pay streak is distributed on an inside bend. And you can kind of take a look at this and see how I'd marked it out here. Now, when you're talking about pay streaks, you know, gold's line of travel, you know, it doesn't necessarily go straight and it, it can follow a, a crazy devious path where it bends one way and goes another way. It's not always a simple thing to just follow it especially if you have a stream that's turning and bending and winding around and going past obstructions and things like that. It can be a complex thing to follow the pay streak. A pay streak may split around a boulder. It may come back together. It may go to one side. It may go to another. You know, it, it, can, be, uh, it can be seemingly in a wrong place if the river had been flowing over there and now it's flowing over here, right? You, it, you might find gold deposited when the river was here and now the river has moved a little bit and so it's not as obvious where you're looking for it. One of the things to remember is that the richest pay streak of gold is not necessarily in the deepest part of the stream. In fact, especially on inside bends, usually it's not. Often the best runs of gold will ride up one side or another of the stream because the flow of water pushes it over there. And like I say, gold only moves during times of really high, fast water. And it's amazing how fast the gold will work its way down to the bedrock and settle in and get stuck. In harder types of bedrock, gold will get stuck in the most minute of crevices. I had an experience some years ago where I found a quarter ounce nugget exposed to the sunlight, it was underwater, uh, but it was in a crevice that honestly was just a little thing that was just barely bigger than the nugget itself. Um, I kind of had to pick at it with a screwdriver to pull the thing out of there because, it, first of all, it was packed in, but secondly, the, the hole that it was in wasn't much bigger than the quarter ounce nugget it, that was sitting in it. Let's take a look at some diagrams and I'll explain better about how pay streaks form on uh, inside bands at stream widenings and, and other factors and how you can use that knowledge to find some good gold for yourself. In this diagram, the river is flowing from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And it shows as the, uh, the water goes around each bend, it swooshes more to one side or the other, but it shows on the inside band, generally more toward the downstream side of the inside band, you have a gold deposit. And one of the things I do also want to say is the sharper the band, the more, uh, the more plain, the more distinct the gold deposit is. The general 
slightly sloping bands may not really make much of a gold deposit at all. Like I said, if you get a straight section of river, you won't get a, a gold deposit because it's not an inside bend. So the stronger the inside bend, the better the gold deposit on the downstream side of it. But this can give you a picture of how the river works to sort through materials and concentrate the gold. This is a great diagram that shows how this works. The upper thing just shows the model. This actually was a model that was done by the a Geological Survey of Canada, where they kind of constructed a fake river and, you know, a test lab river and put some heavy materials in it to see how they would concentrate along their, their model river. And then they drew this drawing to kind of explain what the results were. So the upper one just kind of shows what the model is and what it does. And then the lower uh, branch shows the distribution. So number one is a gentle turn in the river, and you can see it has a small pay streak. And then number two is a, a little bit sharper turn in the river, and it has a little bit longer, more distinct pay streak. And then number three is a very sharp turn, and you can see you have a very distinct pay streak that forms off of that. Number four is back to a moderate type of a bend in the river, and you get another moderate pay streak. Uh, five and six are um, places where a dike or some intrusive rock, something comes across a stream as a, uh, a blockage, as a, a, a something that sticks up into the, of the bed, out of the bedrock. And it shows that gold can collect along there. Now, seven and eight are kind of an interesting thing where uh, the upper part is from the bend in the stream, but you can see a small dark um, thing for a pay streak at the mouth of the little tributary stream that comes in. And that's a tributary pay streak. And we're going to talk more about those in a minute. But uh, there is a pay streak that often forms if you have a tributary that has uh, gold in it in its upper stretches. When it hits the main body of the stream, uh, good gold will drop out. Then number 10 is an island. It could either be a bedrock outcrop or a very large boulder. Uh, and you get, uh, uh, you get a concentration of gold along the edges of that in the stream. And then number 11, again, is a type of a bend in a river, and you get a pay streak from that. So this is an excellent diagram that really does explain a lot of different things that you might see in a stream. So this drawing shows a cutway a section through the inside bend on a river. Um, we saw what the bends look like, but this is if you were to uh, cut a knife through the inside bend, and you would see that the outer part of the river, uh, where the most er erosion happens, you have a very steep, almost cliff-like section, and then... Um, you have the deepest part of the river where the water is. And then at the edge of the gravel bar on the inside bend, you have the pay streak zone. So if you were approaching a river, this is the area that's most likely to have a pay streak. Now with pay streaks, there's a lot of factors to consider. Inside bends, stream widenings, and other things, tributaries. Um, another thing to consider that's important with pay streaks is the uh, the stream gradient. Now it makes a big difference whether the stream is steep or moderate. You know what what it actually is. And in fact, in in really flat conditions, you're just not really going to get a lot of plaster deposits except way at the base of the bedrock. You got to consider that the the stream gradient is kind of like setting your sluice box. If your sluice box is set too high, you'll run gold right through it. If your sluice box is set too flat, then the the, uh, the gravel and sand and stuff won't wash out of it. It'll just accumulate in your box and bury all your riffles. So you know gradient makes a big difference both with sluice boxes and with uh, plaster deposits in the stream. Larger streams and rivers with the grades of about 50 to 100 feet of drop per mile um, are probably the best for forming good, reliable, easy to read uh, placer type of deposits. 
Steeper grades would say over about 150 feet per mile um, tend to get uh, uh, steep and, and some of the finer gold will tend to blow through the, the coarser gold will still stay at that 150 plus but eventually the steeper you get it won't even catch you know maybe the biggest nuggets will be the only thing that'll be able to you know lodge and stay in a place when you have steep grades and suddenly it flattens uh, that can be a good place for gold to to drop out because basically with the steeper grade you have more water pushing and pushing and pushing the gold and then as it kind of flattens out then you have a situation where the uh, gold can start dropping out and if it, if it you know, goes to not going from from really steep to totally flat but steep to a lot less steep you can wash the sand and gravel but at the place where the steepness ends and it goes to a more moderate grade you'll get a good gold dropout that's actually a a well-known uh, pastry uh, type of an issue. Now, uh, the, just as an example, I have a place that I've found a lot of gold at over the years. And in this particular stream, there's a, a good moderate grade up high. Then there's a transition area that's really steep. And then there's another uh, grade area that's pretty moderate. And I've found gold both in the upper area that's, you know, moderate steepness have never found much gold in the really steep transition area and then have found gold in the lower area where it goes back to a more moderate grade. And that's just an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about, how too steep a grade can cause a problem. Let me show you some pictures to better explain this. Here's a good gold bearing stream with a, a moderate type of uh, drop of, uh, and it's a little bit white watery here because this is spring runoff. Uh, and so there's extra water in the stream, but still the amount that it's heading downward as it flows around the bend here is really not that much. It's a, a good moderate. It's enough to get the water out, but not enough that uh, it can't accumulate gold. It's enough to blow out and wash out the sand. Here's a stream that's just too flat. It's just building up material and filling up a valley. Uh, it's the idea if you have a sluice box and you set it too flat, nothing washes through it and you just bury your riffles. Well, that's what's happening in this valley. Uh, the whole valley is just getting buried in mud and sand and the valley continues to rise as material flows out of the streams in the mountains. If there were any placer here, it would be down hundreds of feet down lower into the uh, the bedrock, which is, like I say, probably down three, four hundred feet. This is the opposite problem where it's just too steep. This is actually that steep section I mentioned a minute ago where we found good gold in the moderate uh, grades up above and good gold in the moderate grades down below. But in this steep section, all the gold just blows right through. And although it's dry right now, as I take in this picture, it uh, has a lot of water in it in the springtime. And so it just flushes the gold right on down to the next level. Next, let's talk about individual catches. Now, these are a lot of the kinds of things that a lot of people think of when they think reading a river. We're talking uh, crevices. You know, crevices don't have to be big and wide to catch gold. Um, again, as I mentioned, I had a quarter ounce nugget that was in a crevice that was barely big enough to fit the quarter ounce nugget. So let's talk a little bit about crevices and let me show you some pictures to kind of explain things. Crevices come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, this one here you can see filled with gravel. Uh, it actually cuts across the stream, which that's good. Um, crevices that are perpendicular to the direction of the stream are usually better. Uh, this one is only a couple inches wide and a couple feet long. And I got some nice colors, some nice flakes out of this. But it shows that, you know, in bedrock, you can find crevices all over the place. Crevices uh, don't even have to be long and narrow. They can be round and shaped like this. Now, when you find ones that are just full of water like this and maybe a few rocks, it's not going to have probably much gold in it. But if you find ones like this round that are just jam-packed full of rocks and you can hardly wedge the rocks out of there because they're packed in so tightly, uh, those are the kind that can have good gold at the bottom. The next item is boulders. And... Uh, 
Uh, boulders, you know, where they are in a stream make a big difference. If they're in Gold's line of travel, then they're going to be a lot better than boulders that are one way or the other, not really in Gold's line of travel. But again, boulders are a good thing. So let me show you some pictures and we'll talk about how gold accumulates behind boulders. Here's a big boulder in a stream. This boulder is, mm, I'd say, about the size of a full-size delivery van. It's big, many tons. And it sits right in the middle of the river. And notice it's surrounded on both sides by white water. Because this is, it's not a flood, it's a spring runoff kind of thing. But you can see right behind the boulder, the water is dark and clear and not disturbed. It's because in the wake of the boulder behind it, there's a quiet water area and that's a place where gold can get caught. Let me show you a diagram to explain it further. Here's a diagram I drew up for either a boulder or a bedrock outcrop obstruction in a stream. You'd have this quiet water behind the boulder upstream. The water is flowing past it and uh, in Further from the edge of the fast flowing water is the fine gold. Um, a little bit more out towards the edge of the fast flowing water is the medium deposition zone. And then furthest out, right at the edge of the fast flowing water, at the edge of that uh, dark water that you saw behind the boulder, is where the coarsest gold will be deposited. Next, let's talk about waterfalls. Waterfalls are something that if you watch TV, you think, oh, that's the greatest thing ever. The truth is, um, in spite of what you might see on some gold show, that uh, waterfalls are usually not that great. Most waterfalls are such that uh, it does not catch gold well in them. And so, because, so they're not really all that useful. Now, if you get a waterfall of just the right type, then it can be a great catch. Let me show you a picture or two to illustrate this. So here's my diagram. The upper diagram is what most, the vast majority of waterfalls look like. They're forward slanted. And as the water comes over there, it picks up energy over the waterfall, digs a big hole and just blows everything out downstream. Even if you could find this waterfall at a time when there was no water flowing, you would find little or no gold in the bottom of it. The lower example where the waterfall is back slanted, you can see how the, there's something underneath that's undercut and cut backwards. That's the kind of waterfall that can have a, a good amount of material. This is rare and I've only seen one of them like this in a lot of traveling around, a lot of little waterfalls that I've seen. And I've seen one and it's a good gold trap. If, when it's slanted backwards like this, it's a good gold trap, but slanted forward like 98% of them are, it's a terrible gold trap. Next, let's talk about large bedrock outcrops. It's kind of sort of like a big boulder, only, of course, bedrock outcrop is attached. Uh, but uh, large bedrock outcrops can trap gold behind them in the same way a riffle traps gold uh, behind it in a sluice box. Let me show you some pictures to better explain this. Here's a really complex set of bedrock outcrops in a stream with multiple pieces sticking up here and there and the stream winds around them. And uh, theoretically, every single one of these will have potential as a, a source of gold behind it uh, for, for some sort of gold catch. But, you know, the ones that are in the gold's line of travel in the pay streak line, those are the ones that are going to have by far the best gold behind them. There are some other factors to uh, consider. Let me talk about some other factors and associated things that kind of go with reading a river. Um, one of them is tributaries. Now, uh, we talked about steepness of grade and, and gold deposition. A lot of times tributaries coming in are much steeper than the main branch of a stream uh, that, that the tributary dumps into. If, if they're pretty much the same, this doesn't happen. But we have uh, smaller tributaries, and it happens, of course, only if the smaller tributary has gold in it. But if you have a gold source up in that steep tributary, well, it, because it's steep, it'll blow the gold down. But when it gets to the main river that's much more moderately sloped, you again have this same kind of situation like where you have a river so, and narrow and steep suddenly widen out and open up. The gold drops out, 
uh, sand and gravel keep moving on. And the same thing with, with a tributary, you can get a real nice uh, pay streak right at the mouth of a tributary. Let me show you some diagrams to better explain that. This is a little tributary that dumps into a, a river and you can see the river in the foreground and this tributary is moderately steep and there is gold up there. And so when it comes in, you can see where it dumps into the river, just past where it dumps into the river, it's going to make a little bit of a pay streak as the gold comes down out of this deeper tributary. This sort of thing happens even in the desert when you have streams or ravines that don't flow very often. This is a super steep little desert ravine that comes down and as it's uh, hitting the river where I'm standing, or the drainage where I'm standing, because there's not water in it either, um, you can see as it flattened out, it drops some gold. And in fact, on the right-hand side, you can see rocks that the miners have tossed up out of the main ravine itself looking for gold. Another important thing to consider is false bedrock. Now, uh, we all think of bedrock as being the bottom of a stream, or literally the stream rests on hard, the hard mountain bedrock of the country, of the area that the stream is in. But you can have situations where you have basically what's called a false bedrock or a basically a hard durable surface that's not really part of the mountain it's usually some kind of a layer of clay and in the desert it can be some sort of caliche where you have a, a naturally cemented layer in the gravel and and this acts like bedrock so uh, like years ago when dredging was legal in california i used to dredge a certain area and I quickly learned when I was dredging there, uh, you went down a foot or a foot and a half uh, through the gravel, and then there was this hard pack layer, and it wasn't real bedrock. Well, I thought, well, if I could punch through this hard pack layer and get down to the real bedrock, there'll be lots of gold down there because nobody will have punched through this layer, right? So I worked real hard, punched through the layer, and it was very hard. The layer was full of boulders and stuff. That, I mean, the cemented part below, the, it was full of boulders, and eventually made it down to bedrock. And there was hardly any gold on the bedrock. And so what I quickly learned was if you just went down to that hard layer of clay that was you know, stopping the gold from going further and then just spread your hole out, you got a lot more gold. So I quickly learned that lesson and began to just go through the loose material. And as soon as I hit the false bedrock, I would spread out the hole. It was great. I went to Alaska here a couple of years ago and it was a similar situation. The stream that they were working, there was a layer of clay and, and what I was told was they, they thought that the, uh, the actual true bedrock was down more than a hundred feet. Um, but then on top of this clay layer was good gold and the, the mine operators were getting good gold going down to that clay layer and they would try not to take too much of the clay because the clay would mess up their sluice boxes. Uh, and so if they left just a little bit of gravel behind, you know, because it's hard running a big piece of heavy equipment to, to just, you know, be uh, cutting right on the surface of the clay like, like a, a surgeon with a scalpel, you know, cutting right through something. Um, and they'd leave a little bit of gravel, then I could metal detect there and I would always find little nuggets and stuff, little pickers and things. So uh, false bedrock of clay or caliche in the desert can be very productive. Let me show you some diagrams and we'll talk more about it. One of the things to take mind of when you're placer mining is to always keep an eye for where the gold is coming from. You know, are there any false bedrock layers uh, and then what gold is on it? Now, sometimes you'll get like when I was dredging that there was way more gold on the false bedrock layer than there was on the true bedrock layer. For whatever reason, that's the way it was. But sometimes it's the reverse. There may only be a little bit of gold on the false bedrock layer and a lot of gold on the true bedrock. You just have to test and see. And of course, out in the desert, you have uh, layers that get cemented uh, just by the natural flow of uh, lime and limestone in the rock and the water and drying out. You can get gravels that get totally cemented just like concrete. And then those hard layers will become a... A false bedrock and sometimes there can be multiple false bedrock layers um, it isn't doesn't have to be that there's just one so it's a good idea to keep an eye on where the gold is coming from and what false bedrock layers you have if any 
Okay, let's talk about some other of these factors that I mentioned, like false bedrock and stuff. Another one that I want to talk about is what I call uh, skim bars or flake flood gold. Now, uh, really small gold doesn't necessarily always work its way down to bedrock. You can get layers of really fine flaky gold and a lot of times these are just little tiny colors and stuff that uh, can, you know, they're almost like almost dust sized. Uh, they can act more like beach gold where basically um, you have a, a surface and in the the flow of water is enough to move the light sand away but it leaves the black sand and other heavy materials behind and you get these accumulations of what they call flood gold they're usually kind of on top of gravel bars or on top of harder surface layers they, where the harder surface layer underneath does kind of act like a false bedrock the rich layers, again, like beach deposits, are usually relatively thin and you mine that thin out. But the thin layer itself, if you process it right, can be actually rather rich. They normally extend only a certain length and a certain width. Uh, and the guys that get the skill of recognize these, recognizing these, uh, what they call skim bars or skim plasters, it's just a skimming along the surface, accumulation of black sand that uh, can be really rich in gold. Now, skim plasters are, you know, not something that a big mining company would ever be interested in because they're small in extent, but they're perfect for the individual prospector. Let me show you a diagram or two and explain it better in more detail. Here's a diagram of a typical skim bar. You can see that it's at the head of a, a bend in the river, and they're very thin, uh, but this explains, and then the outer part of it is the part richest in gold, and this is something, though, that if you find a place like this uh, and you mine it out, it's probably easily mined out in a few days or even a day, but you can come back in the next year or maybe even after a period of high water and it'll reform and it keeps reforming and it keeps reforming. And that's the way beach plasters are, too. They reform during period of the right weather and right uh, tides and stuff. Let's talk next about bench gravels. Now, I kind of mentioned this a little bit. Bench gravels are things that occur when you have a gravel as a river cuts down in its, its bed. It can leave pieces of gravel, you know, areas of gravel, stranded high and dry so that the river never, even at flood stage, never gets this high again. And those can be really great sources of gold for prospectors. They have been great sources of gold since the early days. And they're basically, if they're still there, if the gravel's still there, it's virgin gravel that's never been touched. So bench gravels can be really great and they can be uh, pretty small. I mean, it's not necessarily a huge area of gravel. It can be pretty small and pretty rich. I'm gonna show you some pictures and they better explain this, but I've done really well with bench gravels and so I recommend them to you. So let's take a look at some pictures. This is a picture of a bit of bench gravel up above a modern stream. It's just a little higher than the stream ever reaches now when it's um, at flood stage. It's maybe 20 feet above the typical height of the stream in the summertime. But you can see, you can see the bedrock, you can see the gravel on the bedrock. And, you know, there's no more stream deposition up here. So if it's still here it's never been disturbed and people have dug at it you can kind of see over toward the left that people have dug a little bit of a hole in some of these things and uh, but still it's virgin gravel in place and it's a place that you can find a lot of gold i think i may do a whole video on bench gravels because they're that important Next, let's talk about ancient river gravels. Sometimes uh, you get river channels that get filled with lava or there's uplift and cut down so fast that you get entire riverbeds stranded high and dry. Not just a patch of gravel like a bench, but in almost entire rivers stranded up on the top of mountains or near the top of mountains. Um, these have happened in a number of places around the world. Um, you, old river channels in the uh, Mother Lode country of California got buried with volcanic ash during eruptions long ago in the, what's called the tertiary period. And so you have what they call these 
tertiary channels. But there are similar ancient deep leads in Australia, uh, similar sorts of things in the Klondike region of Alaska and elsewhere. It's not a unique thing for California. But those ancient rivers, when they flowed back in the day, they were subject to the same rules and, and laws of placer deposition that affect the modern streams. And so they're also very good sources of gold. And they can have well-defined uh, pastry lines within them, just like a modern river. Let's take a look at some pictures and diagrams. We'll talk a little bit more about it. These ancient river gravels are way up on the mountain, often at or near the top of the mountain. And they may be buried in lava or uh, ash, volcanic ash. But way at the bottom, underneath the lava and volcanic ash, you'll find river gravels. And there'll be, if they're in a gold-bearing area, they'll be full of gold. These were great sources of gold to the early day miners and still are to prospectors today. Perhaps the most important thing is to use your knowledge when you prospect. You know, you get excited, I do, a lot of the guys do, I know, uh, gals that do. You get excited about getting out and looking for gold and you get out to a spot and you think, oh, I'm gonna go here and, and you don't stop to use your knowledge because if you take the time to learn the skill of reading a river for gold, then you know, you want to use that. You want to use that knowledge, that experience that you've gained. Real rivers are complex and with twists and bends and obstructions and changes over time. You know, a river that used to flow over here, now it's flowing over there. You know, the, it's, it's a, a complex kind of a world and it needs, and of course, you're looking at it in the summertime and the gold is being deposited when it's flowing like a flood, you know, rumbling and rolling down. So you need to stop, think about what did this stream look like when the water was 10 feet higher than it is now or 15 feet higher than it is now. You need to stop and think about it and use your knowledge to select the best places. You know, you, when you take the time, select a spot and give it a try. Sample it. Take some, you know, take some dirt, run it, see what it goes. You know, see if it really does, if you, you know, your estimation of, of what the best spot's going to be, see if that really works. And if it doesn't, then don't just keep digging there. A lot of guys, you know, if, if you try a spot and it just doesn't work out, you're only getting a few specs, they just keep digging there thinking, well, eventually I'll get into something, maybe. Um, you gotta keep sampling, try a different spot, you know, step back again and think about it and then go try the second place spot and keep sampling and keep trying different things because that's how you're gonna get to the better spots. You know, sometimes you know, it doesn't always work out the first time or even the second time or even the third time. You need to keep, keep looking until you find what you're looking for. There's lots of locations out there to test. And if you're looking for a spot, if you're a new prospector and you're looking for spots to try your hand at prospecting and gain some experience at doing it, you know, I always recommend join a club. Not everybody loves my uh, suggestion, but it's a good idea, and especially for new, new guys, uh, to get out there and find something. Get a club, get your feet wet, and, and you know it can be really useful to you. The truth is that reading a river for gold isn't easy. It takes sampling and trying and, and you know putting your head into the river and, and thinking about it. it. If you don't, you're gonna end up with just a few specs while maybe just down the stream, some other guys getting grams and, and more and doing a lot better than you. So take the time to think about it. Because reading a river, like all the rest of prospecting, it's a skill and you learn it over time. You learn the, the basic stuff, you put it into practice and you get some field learning to go on top of your book learning, the videos you watch, and you become skilled at doing this. Now, like I say, you know, the whole thing about learning to prospect, learning to read a river is a skill. And I've written a book to help you gain those skills, gain all the related prospecting skills and understand finding gold better. And my book is called Fistful of Gold because 
That's what I want you to be able to go out and find is Fistful of Gold. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So this is my book, Fistful of Gold. You can see it's an encyclopedia distilling down my 45 plus years of prospecting experience plus my degree into the parts that you need to know. I spent most of 10 years writing this. It was not just a simple effort that, uh, oh, I sat down and wrote it. You can see it's like a quarter of a million words. It's not something you're going to read through in a day or maybe even a week or more. But it's got a lot of information and reference material that you can come back to. You know, you can read it once and read it again and get more out of it because there's just that much depth of material in this. I wrote this book because I want you to have the skills to go out and find fistfuls of gold for yourself. And if you have the skills and know what you're doing and get out in the field and make a real effort, you can find significant gold. It's not easy. I'm not going to tell you that because, you know, gold, it, it wouldn't be, you know, close to $2,000 an ounce, which is what it is right now. It wouldn't be so expensive if it was easy to find. It's not easy. You just can't walk out into an old gold field and start picking up nuggets. If the, if the gold was easy to see and find, the old timers would have picked it up and taken it themselves. So you got to have skill. You got to know what you're doing. You got to be able to, to master what it takes to find gold. And you've got to have the persistence and put in the effort to find the material, to find the gold or diamonds or gemstones that you're looking for. Now, this has book has geology, it has facts about gold, it has stuff about diamonds and platinum, but it's mostly about gold, gold deposits, how gold deposits form, how placer and nuggets form, you know, all the questions you've probably wanted to ask. The book is available on Amazon, and I'll put a link to it in the description below, but you can look up on Amazon, This Full of Gold, and, by Chris Ralph, and find this book. Now, the book, if you look on it, it has a very high rating. It has like a 4.7 or 4.8 out of 5, which is really high. I mean, it's hard to please everybody, but I'm close to a 5 out of 5, not far from it, right? So it's been out. I've sold more than 15,000 copies of this book, and I've had tremendous response, tremendous positive response by the people who buy it. And I think if you buy it, you'll be just as happy with it. Now, in addition to my book, I also have a website that I do. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my website and show you some images from the website right now. Now, my website is NevadaOutbackGems.com, and I'll put a link to the prospecting page, this prospecting encyclopedia page, down in the description below, but you can find it at Nevada Outback Gems. Uh, I sell some jewelry, turquoise, other gemstones there. Uh, I don't always keep the uh, inventory perfectly up to date, so if you're interested in anything you see, do contact me first before trying to send me money or anything, because I want you to be able to get what you order. But the website has lots of different stories, old adventures, uh, even some stories, uh, true stories from the old time miners of the 1800s. So I think it's uh, something you'll find interesting. The other thing I want to go back to is that all my comments, I want you guys to ask questions on the comments for my videos. I answer 100% of the comments that are made on my videos. Now, sometimes if somebody just says, hey, great video, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, the comment may just be, well, I'm really glad you liked it. Uh, or, or, you know, if it's a simple question. Um, and, and sometimes I get people who ask me questions, I would take a book to answer that question. And I recommend that they just buy the book. But I answer all my questions. I try to help people as much as I can. I'm here to help you. So if you're interested in gaining the skills, if you're interested in knowing what you need to know to be successful, follow along with me. Subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell so that they'll let you know when I come out with new videos. And I try to do that pretty much every Saturday morning. And you'll enjoy with me. You'll come along with me. We'll have an adventure together. And we will find some nice gold and see what it's really like.
getting out in the woods or the deserts or the mountains, wherever we land, wherever the gold is, wherever the diamonds are, wherever the platinum is. Come along. We'll have some fun. And I'll see you real soon on the next video.